The 540 is brought to you by Star City Games Weekly Sale. Go to StarCityGames.com slash sale, that's S-A-L-E, right now through April 5th at 10.59 a.m. Eastern Time. And this is a big one, and specifically directed at you, because I know you, like Magic Cards, if you're listening to this podcast, you can save 10% off any single on the website. Yes. All of them. Every single one. 10%. Now through April 5th at 10.59 a.m. You do not want to miss this one. It doesn't come around often. And if you want to be sure that you are checking out the best we have to offer on the weekly sale every week, starting at 11 a.m. Monday morning, make sure to bookmark starcitygames.com slash sale so you can get what you want and you don't miss out. The 540 is also brought to you by Coalesce Apparel and Design. If you want to get the coolest magic t-shirts and hoodies and stickers, go to coalesceapparel.shop. And if you find something you like, use gift code SCG to save 10% off at checkout. That's coalesceapparel.shop. Nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. What's up, everybody? Cedric Phillips here, stopping by real quick to let you know about one of Star City Games' newest podcasts, The Resleevables, hosted by yours truly, alongside my partner in crime, of course, Patrick Sullivan, where the two of us discuss magic sets, both past and present, from top to bottom. On every episode of The Resleevables, you're going to hear us talk about the facts of a set, the mechanics of a set, the cycles of a set, you know, the boring stuff, before we get into some crazy stories of when we were playing magic during the times that the set was legal. Uh, We've got a ridiculous award show where we give out awards like the Char Rumbler Award for Weirdest Card in a Set, the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for Best Card in the Set, and a whole bunch more. Before we finally decide, hey, what card won the set and what letter grade should we give the set? It's a whole lot of fun. We're having a blast recording them. Hopefully you have the opportunity to listen to it and you enjoy it as much as we're enjoying recording them. Where can you find it? StarCityGames.com or wherever else you listen to your podcast. The Receivables, every single week here at SCG. Welcome back to the 540. As always, I am Justin Parnell, and you can find me at jparnell1 on Twitter, and of course, my illustrious co-host, Ryan Overturf, who you can find at Ryan Overdrive on Twitter. There he is. You can also find Ryan in the the, the mean streets of Twitter, which is a different Twitter, roughing up people who think they have, you know, think that every new card is the best card they've ever seen, and Ryan will put a stop to that. <laughs> I try to focus on what excites me when a new set comes out, because first of all, there's hundreds of cards in every set. Some of them are going to be bad. Some of them aren't going to be for me. I get it. That's fine. That's reasonable. That's good, actually. But when people get really excited about a card that's not really good, I, you gotta sneak that I told you so in for later. Yeah. I feel like, you know, okay, there's there's two ways to go about this. You know, as we're in the midst of, of Strixhaven preview season right now, well, we are at, at time of recording. Now, this is moving pretty fast, so by the time by the time this podcast comes out, you're going to know significantly more about this set than Ryan and I do at, at, at moment of speaking. But I feel like it's easier to not look like an asshole if you're just thrown out of the ether like hey if you like this card you're an idiot i'm not pointing anyone out i just said in general if you like this card you're an idiot and you can identify yourselves as idiots on your own time (laughs) rather than like going into somebody's replies and being like yep nope this card is terrible and your ability to identify cards is terrible and the next card you think is also gonna be terrible which some people do and i think if you go with option a i think you're in the clear as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, I stay out of the replies. The whole thing is Twitter is this void where you paint your own garbage on the side of your own house. And (laughs) people will come and approach you as they will. That's just how people are. But the idea is you say your piece, you move on to the next thing. 
ideally, you don't even remember that you tweeted the thing in the first place. It's just literally what you think. It's not a good platform for conversation. It's a platform where you just say, hey, this is what I'm up to. This is a picture of my lunch. This is what I think. Uh, and jumping at someone's replies and being like, you're stupid for being excited. Like that, that actually just makes you a bad person. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a very apt description of Twitter. I think you're just, the, you're painting stuff on your own. Yeah. More of a barn probably. Sure. Yeah. It's a big space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we do have a brand new set that is upon us, which of course for cube owners is always something that is a very exciting time. Now as magic players, that time has shrunk between the exciting time to exciting time, because it seems like <laughs> every set is, you know, every week a new set is coming out. Maybe some truth to that, maybe not, but either way, Strixhaven followed by commander. So I imagine that we're going to be, gifted with a lot of potential options for cubes. And with the way that cards are designed now, it is more likely that you'll you'll get more out of a set than you probably would have of any random set five years ago. It's the gilded age, Justin. <laughs> it really is. Well, when you when you're when the when the machine keeps turning and it doesn't stop, it's gonna be the gilded age. <laughs> even if even if the same percentage of cards are good which I would say that they're a little bit better than, than they used to be. Even if the same percentage of cards are good, we're still getting like a, a, a 12 dozen more cards that are considerations for cube because we're getting like, like you know, 150 times more cards than we got five years ago. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, some of it is just some of the cards are really pushed. Obviously, that's a way to get things into your vintage cube, your legacy cube, the really high power environment. But... They've also been just kind of gassing up the more thematic cards. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between when you started playing or when I started playing and opening a booster pack today. They kind of design it so just every rare is a card that somebody could play somewhere, which if you go back through the history of Magic, that was not always the case. No, sometimes you open a mud hole. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've there's... opened a mud hole. I've op I opened... I went to... I was on vacation with my friend and we went to a card shop and we both got one pack of Odyssey. I opened a mud hole and he opened a Call of the Herd. And now Call of the Herd right now is terrible. But let me tell you at the time, that was a that was a horrible experience that I learned about opening packs of magic. That and is it was brutal. The, it was not good, yeah. That could rock the foundation of your friendship. Friendship. That's the disparity it, between these it, cards. It did, and he rubbed it in my face. We were, <laughs> you know, we were children. We were, you know, we were we were young and, uh, you know, well, teenagers. But it was uh, it was difficult. It was a, it was a very difficult ride back because I was with his family. Uh, so there's only so much of a little shit I could be about it. But let me <laughs> tell you, I was I was unhappy for the rest of that day. Yep, that, we went and got tracks. more packs. We went and got more packs later, but it it didn't. They none of those packs erased the sting of the the mud hole v uh, call of the herd opening. Well, your friend could get several packs trading in that call of the herd money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't matter. Mud hole just <laughs> it was pro appropriately named. Stomped a mud hole in my heart. That's what it did. <laughs> but I recovered, and uh, here I am. You know, still talking about mud hole. Didn't 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 waver my love of magic. Apparently, surprisingly, it really should have. In right. retrospect, it really should have, but it did not. So shame on you, wizards. Someone out there that's listening to this podcast, you may know the person responsible for this, and they've hurt me as a child, and I want them to carry that for the rest of their life. <laughs> Mud hole, get out of here. Who thought that should be a rare? Who ever thought that should be a rare? They look at this and they're like. They're going to love filling up their graveyard with this. No, they're not. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be a very good card to print at common either, to be fair. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's very true, Ryan. <laughs> it would not be a good card to print at common. Where would it be a good card to print? What rarity would you say this belongs at? Hmm. I, I think that stopping it at it's a bad card to print is maybe uh, where 
the yes. discussion could be shelved. Yes. Yeah, you don't... I mean, I guess it's... If at anything, it's like a uncommon... It's like a niche sideboard card in case the, the land threshold deck takes off in standard. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to talk about Mudhole. <sighs> well, I don't even know what we were talking about. I've been blinded by this. Ryan, speaking of old times and, and longing for things that have long passed or maybe not fondly remembering packs you've opened. We were talking before the show about like a cube bucket list. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is something that everyone probably has more of than they might think. Like just things that you want to do, that you want to experience or build relating to cube that you have not had a chance to before. Yeah, and for some people, their cube bucket list or to-do list is like, oh, I would like to own a cube someday. For me, I am deep down the rabbit hole. Um, I've tried this, that, and the other thing. I have several cubes in rotation right now. I got a couple ideas kicking around. And so I get an idea of something that I've either literally tried by seeding it into one of my cubes or something that I've looked at on paper and come to the realization that there's just not enough support in the history of the game to make it really work in an environment where it would be interesting to play with, with those cards for me. So an example, here, here's, here's a big item on my cube bucket list. I, I have some plans, but um, as of now, it is untested. But I want an environment where I can draft Death Shadow in a cube. And there's like a little bit here and there. You get some some morsels, uh, Scourge of the Skyclaves, the two mm -hmm. mana Death Shadow esque creature from Zendikar Rising that uh, has power equal to twenty minus the highest life total. That's like another creature that pushes you there. Phyrexian mana works with it. Actually, the biggest disappointment when you look at mechanics that work for Death Shadow, like you have to be a format where you care about attacking and blocking. And then you have to be a format where you are managing your life total some. You can get that with, like, Phyrexian mana. A lot of ways to pay life, fetch land, shock lands. You, you can do that sort of thing. Yep. But there's, like, not that much payoff. And, in fact, like, there's a keyword that is kind of very Death Shadow-esque. Fateful Hour from Dark Ascension. It's a mm. mechanic where cards do something or do more if you have five or less life. But I think that there's exactly seven of them, and they're basically all bad. Or, like, there's one or two that are okay. Thraven Doomsayer is the one that I'm thinking of off the top of my head, which I think is a, a pretty reasonable card. Yeah. That's Thraven the one that Doomsayer, makes tokens. Uh, Gather the Townsfolk is, is yes. reasonable. Yeah, the token-making ones. <laughs> so. <laughs> Let's see. F Fateful Hour. There are eight of them. One mm. of them appears only in Modern Horizons. What's the one in Modern Horizons? Spell Snuff. It oh, it's is, like it's like literally cancel. It's one blue blue cancel, and then if it's fateful hour, it turns into dismiss instead. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you would th think for how t uh, stre stressful it is and how difficult it is to manage a game where you operate on five or less life, some of these cards would be better. You would think so. You would really think that the payoff would be significantly better. Well, which is why, like Thraben Doomsayer, that one's pretty reasonable because that like double it like double glorious anthems all of your creatures. Yeah, I have that That's one a pretty in the good spooky payoff. cube. It's just like kind of a nice human. Yeah, it looks like an out of work Liam Neeson on the <laughs> art. <laughs> yeah, so I, I I think that's a noble goal because I also am a lover of Death Shadow personally, but. You have to you have to make so many like full cube concessions to even like start going down that path. And it, it ends up being weird because there's just not enough other cards that care, like you said. Mm -hmm. That are even and, and and that's just like enough enough cards that care, period. Not even when you get to enough cards that care that are good. Right. Maybe yeah, you can day. put them all there and it's it's uh underwhelming in terms of total cards and even more underwhelming when you read what they do yeah which you should avoid to do that because they're not they're not good you won't be happy yeah not, not, not like a full-on mud hole situation but no 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 
I don't think there's a need for you to keep bringing that back up, but <laughs> if you want to just keep it in your pocket for a second. That's fine. That's fine. Just maybe just this episode. I don't want I don't want the sting of of mud hole. Yeah, that, I'd bury that down deep, Ryan. I don't even know. I don't even know how, how we got to it, but I'd bury that down deep. And now I'm remembering that day very vividly. All right. I'll be more sensitive. That's fine. You don't. I know you don't have to and you know you're not going to. So it's <laughs> we, don't to, we don't we don't have to sit here and lie to each other. A, a cube, a cube that I want. I don't even know if I want to build. <laughs> but I want someone else to build is a cube that is uh, exclusively made to rotisserie draft. Ooh. Rotisserie draft is my favorite limited format of all time. Cube rotisserie draft is my favorite limited format. I have done uh, 33 rotisserie drafts in my life, which is a significant number, if you are familiar with that. Uh, you essentially lay out the entirety of a cube and you do a snake draft for some number of rounds. And then ultimately, the cards that are not drafted are set aside, and then the ones that are make up your draft selections and you make your deck off of that. If I might add, I believe the correct number of rounds is around 35. For a rotisserie draft. A lot of people start with something like 45 because that is the traditional drafting method, three packs of 15. But ultimately, uh, hate drafting becomes too prevalent when you have that many picks. And the last 10 picks, there is a significant, significantly greater divide between the haves and the have nots of people that are competent in drafting. And it yields too many twisted results when you get to the game playing portion, which seems like you're like, well, of course you would want that because you want the person that's the most prepared to win. You do, but when someone, when that person is just like, I want to draft mono red and I drafted all my cards in 30 picks and I can spend the next 15 picks hate drafting, that's not exactly where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also, like, I am a fairly spiky player. I care about the quality of the decks that I draft. But in general, I just... I don't think Cube is the place for that. I think just trying to set it up so that everybody has a decent chance of mm -hmm. winning a good chunk of their matches is the way that you have the best time with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it puts... it, it Having a lim more limited number of picks there puts emphasis on actually making decisions. Where... You get you, otherwise you get to the point of like everyone's kind of doing what they're doing and you can kind of get what they want and you don't have to prioritize things as much and I think that I think pri prioritizing pick one through your literal last pick is makes for a more enjoyable experience anyway yeah. and I also like think hate drafting is kind of boring and if we're talking about a point where you're hate drafting because you already have a deck then there's not a yep. cost to it and like there should exactly. at least be a cost to it correct I, I totally agree. So ultimately, that's, that's something I've landed on through my many, many times doing a rotisserie draft. But I want to draft a cube that is entirely designed to rotisserie draft. When I was regularly updating my cube, my 540-card cube, as you'll know, is the name of the podcast as well, <laughs> which uh, I had a package that I called the rotisserie package that I essentially would add... Uh, between 15 and 25 cards kind of depended on what was else was going on in the cube that allowed for some more archetypes to flourish and stuff that would maybe not be at that time highly drafted in a normal cube environment but in a rotisserie environment all of the cards are significantly more interesting so this is this when is you bust out your oust i like first of all I like oust, okay? okay. Sorry, uh, so I, meant, I meant condemn. I meant condemn. I said oust. I meant condemn. I was going for the callback and just named a card I would rather play with. <laughs> yeah, oust, yeah, oust is better than condemn. Yeah. Uh, theoretically, yes. Theoretically, yes. Cards, cards like that that are like archetype specific. But honestly, it was more like now I added Delver of Secrets as their artistry package because often that card because sometimes... Not great in normal, a normal cube draft, but in a rotisserie draft where you can make a blue-red spells deck, card's pretty sweet. 
uh, stuff like uh, more like artifacty matters cards, like even something like uh, Mishra's Workshop, which in in a in a cube that's not like incredibly artifact heavy. And again, this is in a powered cube. Uh, that you might always have access to that card uh, at the beginning of a draft. So if you find it late, it's going to go unpicked. So doesn't always make the didn't make the list for the full cube. A lot of times it always made the rotisserie package. Anyway, I want to draft a cube where someone has completely designed it as a rotisserie experience. I think that would be really awesome. That'd be cool. Yeah, so that's on my cube bucket list. So if anyone listening has done that, hit me up, and when when we get to the uh, the after time, when we can start going to events again, sometime next year, I'm I'm down. You just gotta let me know the the, the when and the where, and I'm down. I have not rotisserie drafted nearly as much as you have, but I also would be into that. I re- I have uh, I spent a long time where I would go to events on and then on Sunday we would just rotisserie draft, probably for like a two or three year span, where you know every six weeks I'd be doing a rotisserie draft at a at a, a GP or some other large event. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So, Ryan, anything else on your cube bucket list that you want to mention before we head on? The other big one for me, I guess, is is landfall. I I want we got some more stuff with Zendikar Rising, but there's still kind of a hole there because landfall is difficult. Because the things that are exciting and cool about it, I like the beatdown creatures. I like the step links. I like Akum Hellhound. Yeah. I like whatever the red green two drop is named. I forgot the name of that one. Uh Brushfire Elemental, I think. I was gonna say Bushwhacker Elemental, but yes, Brushfire Elemental, <laughs> you're right. Uh and that stuff is cool, but a lot of landfall stuff is literally just like, hey, you're putting a bunch of lands on the battlefield. How about casting six mana spells and drawing extra cards? So I'm trying to figure out how to do that in a way that keeps the aggressive slant instead of getting to the point where it's just like, hey, all your step links are dead and I have seven cards in my hand. So it's it's, it's tougher to design than you would think, at least if you care about the quality of the games. I totally agree. In fact, I agree very much, Ryan. And this may come up later. Ooh. It's a good plant. Yeah, it is, specifically. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about things that we want, things that we desire for each color in Magic from a cube perspective only. We're going to take a break and be back in just a minute. Have some extra cards laying around that you want to get rid of? Go to StarCityGames.com sell. It has never been easier to turn your cards into cash, or if you're looking to outfit your cube or commander deck with some new favorites, get a 30% trade-in bonus when you choose store credit. No matter what your collection looks like, we have a method for you. Want to see exactly what every card you have is worth? Check out our buy list. Don't have time for that? Stick it on a box. Send it to us, and we'll make you an offer with our ship and sell program. Or if you want a more personal touch, make your way to the Star City Game Center in Roanoke, Virginia to sit down with a buyer just like the old days. With the fastest turnaround time in the industry, get an offer in under four days when you go to StarCityGame.com slash sell. Selling has never been easier. All right. As cube owners and cube designers and cube players, we are often very greedy with what we want wizards to print for us. Now... I stand behind that greed, and I do not feel bad about making these requests. Some of them may be outlandish, some of them may not be, but either way, I expect wizards to listen to what my requests are and print those uh, within the next three years. I know that's what your design cycle is, so I don't want to be too greedy and say, like, next year, but, you know, I expect to see all of these things that we're going to talk about in the next three years. The heart wants what it wants, and y'all better deliver. It's true. I also want to note here, as we go through this list of things that we want for Cube on a color-by-color basis, I well, I am understanding that some of the things I may be asking are going to negatively impact construct formats, and I do not care. 
just want to lay that out there. I am not at all, n at no point in time have I thought about how this might negatively impact Constructed. A little collateral damage. It's acceptable. We're talking about Cube. Come on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Cube is forever. Standard is for like like 24 to 18 months, so who cares? Yeah. We've Look, we've had plenty of bad standards recently. Magic will be fine. They just ban all the cards anyway. Who cares? Yeah, what's the difference? All right, so let's start with white. Ryan, do you have a... Uh, what do you want? What do you want out of white for cube? So <laughs> there's, there's kind of a broader conversation about how white just needs better cards. And my general note for white is just kind of like a shitbird note. Um, they should make more interesting white cards. That's kind of where I'm coming from because... When you design a cube, if, even if you have a really cool theme, there's a lot of ways to make at least three of the other colors work with most things. And then white mm -hmm. is like, you get creatures that attack and block and you get Wrath of God. Yeah. You get rules setting permanence. And it's just, give, give me some more stuff with a little finesse. Give me some white cards that play into the other themes. Um, we get a little bit more all the time. An example of a recent cube card that I really like, but I want to see more of, and I like to see kind of gassed up, uh, Clarion Spirit. It's one and a white for a 2-2, two, two. and when you play your second spell, you get a 1-1 one, one Spirit, a Flying Spirit at that. Like, that's a card that I think probably should already be in the Magic Online Vintage Cube, and plays pretty well in your beatdown deck or can go into a Spells Matter deck, but it's not quite a flag post or a signpost or a flagship, rather. It's not a card that says, okay, draft this sort of thing. I am really good if you're doing this sort of thing. It's more like a card that you would put in your Spells Matter deck, but you still have to justify playing white, and the card doesn't quite do it. Yeah, I think we can push the power level a little on that sort of thing. I think that's a really good start, and that's something that I have thought very much while I'm drafting Kaldheim, because I, I avoid white and, and black in that draft and every time i see clearing spirit i'm like you're really cool but i also know that you're a trap so <laughs> yeah and yeah. Uh, something that would go a decent way we get defiant strike they printed defiant strike like five times now yeah like can we get a white cantrip that always draws a card that doesn't need a target like even if you just color shifted warlord's fury just one mana draw a card your creatures get first strike on a turn which is a pretty white ability. That sort I think of thing moves the needle. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So this is also kind of the angle of what I, my, I would be making my case on is let's grab some other stuff from other colors and give them to white where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, will take, I, I will take it a step further. I think that I would like conditional counter spells to be in white. Okay. We, so we you have, want like mana leak in white? Uh. Kind of, but uh, more, I'm thinking more, may, maybe instead of Mana Leak, have, like, Mana Leak cost just white, so one in white, but it says counter target spell unless its controller pays one for each creature you control. Okay. So you're getting stuff on the board, but it allows you to press your advantage, because I really like the idea of having a legitimate, like, tempo, like, white as, like, a tempo color, but right now you can't really do that unless you're pairing it with something else, and that's then you're mudding the waters of, of of what white is supplying which is just the attacking and blocking like you were talking about mm -hmm. that makes sense um and i would like to see some more white creatures that with one or two cards you can either demand a sweeper effect or immediate one for one removal or mm -hmm. press their advantage on their own like i would literally love a color shifted to white tireless tracker yeah yeah that'd be a sweet one yeah, I mean that's a that's a good point too. I I really okay. I mean that's basically taking stuff from other colors and giving it to white. Even you don't even have to change anything really. I wanted it like with what I'm what I'm kind of asking, which is for like conditional counter spells. I wanted to mold it more to white because I want you to rather than like like you said like not mana leak exactly, but mana leak, but you do it in a white way. You gotta have you have to have creatures and. I think Tireless Tracker, one, is one of my favorite green creatures of all time. Two, I would love for it to be in white because you don't have anything that is that is pressing the advantage unless it is just something that's power and toughness or a Planeswalker. 
White has a lot of good planeswalkers. I'll give it that. Mm-hmm. I think I think that's actually where it is standing above the rest of the colors on average. I think every color has one or two really excellent planeswalkers, and I think White's uh, average planeswalker is better than the rest. Yep, I agree. Um, so do you feel like that's something that they could do for what you're asking across all rarities? Because, you know, if we're not just looking at cube that, cubes that include, include rares or higher power levels. It, I mean, white is also pretty far behind in, in popper too. So I think you're going to want to have some of it at least trickle down to common. And I don't think you need to go historically powerful in terms of cards across rarities. You just need to start pushing the envelope a little bit more. And I understand that they're walking a tightrope with some stuff. Like, literally, they're trying to implement more white card draw, but you can't just make a white concentrate. It wouldn't make any sense. It's kind of what you're alluding to when you talk about making a conditional counter spell, but you want it to count creatures so that's still doing something that white cares about. Exactly. You have to figure that stuff out. There's two mechanics that they've done recently. One of them has had some support in white, one of them not really, that I think would play really well together, that maybe are difficult to make evergreen, but there's something there. My, my brain tells me there's something cool that could work here. But I like the idea of white having sort of a theme where you get paid off for drawing two cards a turn and combining that with investigate, with clue tokens. So That'd you have be to really awesome. like invest some mana in it pick the turn where you want it to go off, but you can get paid off in that kind of way, which makes a lot of sense to me and sounds like it could be really cool. Definitely, definitely. And you can and you can flavor that in a way that totally makes sense in white. We are obviously, this is a very pro Th- Thraben Inspector podcast. Oh yeah. The best so, white card yet printed. I, I couldn't, I, couldn't I, I have no disagreement for that. <laughs> I can't think of a single white card that's better, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it just, just tilting things, like honestly... I feel like Wizard's reluctance to adjust things to white is because it doesn't fit flavorfully. But you can adjust that too. And I, I, I think you just, like, at this point, we're just in the, we're in the time where we need to force that. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Anything else on white that you want? Um, that, that, that's kind of like the major idea that I have on white, but... Yeah, even if they just artlessly push the power level, I, I wouldn't really complain. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think they can do it with a more uh, a more creative touch as well. I think it can be done. Mm-hmm. I don't want a whole lot out of my counter spells. I don't want I don't want counter spell. I don't want mana leak, but I would love to have like I would love to have like a like a two two flash creature that manatized something, like that manatized when it entered the battlefield. Yeah, amusingly, we'll, we'll get to this in a bit, but they did a slow reveal over the weekend for uh, Paulo Vitor Dama de Rosa's World Championship card. Mm-hmm. And one of the first thoughts I had was a flash creature that manatized, and I got Boom. excited about that concept. Yes, exactly. That's really all I want. Like, it doesn't, the creature doesn't even have to be that good. Like, yeah, it can just, be a 2 1 with no static abilities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just just mantide something when it enters the battlefield. I think I think those type cards are are that's kind of what I want with like trickiness for white because white is just so it's so not tricky. It's just like all right, I'm I'm playing my stuff out. Hope you don't do anything till I get to my next turn. Yeah. And every other cre- every other color, like even green, has more flexibility in that than white does. And I think that just needs to be slightly turned to the. Turn it to the side for white. Yep, agreed. Okay, uh, blue. I'll start with this one. I have a question. How cheap can an Ophidian be? Ooh. And it doesn't have to be good, but like, how cheap can it be? Is it possible to have a one mana Ophidian? I Pro- don't probably see not. why you would want that. I mean, I see why you would want, like you would want that. I don't see <laughs> sure. why one would want that. Uh, kind of my notes on blue is that historically there's no need for anything. You could literally never print another blue card, and I would not have difficulty fitting blue into a myriad of different cube environments and actually have the problem where it, it has to be 
tempered to the rest of the power level over time because <laughs> blue just has a lot of historically really powerful effects. Yes, very true. I, I would like to see more tricky, cool, interesting one and two mana creatures. I, I think not necessarily a Fidian <laughs> or even a Merfolk Looter style effect, but more blue stuff that cares about combat, I think is a good direction to make it more appropriate. A couple of my favorite cube cards that were recently printed in blue are Ghostly Pilfer, which is a two mana two one. You can discard a card to make it unblockable. Mm -hmm. And then it has the key to the city effect where when you untap it, you can pay two mana to draw a card. Yep. And Watcher from Tomorrow, which is a two mana two one Love that with card. hideaway, and you put the card in your hand when it dies. And there's just like cards with good enough bodies to show up that can exploit synergies as well, which I think is pretty cool. Instead of just giving you one card that's busted no matter how you play it. See, Ryan, you you jumped in to bite my head off on this, but my whole angle was going to be I would like to tie Blue's powerful effects up into creatures rather than spells because then they can be disrupted more easily by the other colors and it makes them more interesting to play with. Well, it's easy to claim that now, Justin. Well, here we are, and I'm claiming it. <laughs> well, and then I, I agree with you. Yes. So what I was going, what the point I was going to be with 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 Aphidians, which is of course for those of you that do not know, a creature from Weatherlight that uh, when it when it was unblocked, you could have it deal no combat damage to your opponent to instead draw a card. It was a one three, a little snake, a little tiny baby snake that was whispering in someone's ear. Anyway. Also looked like there was a uh, a lattice tablecloth over the art. It's very it's cool art. Yeah. So what? Yeah, but what I was gonna say is, you know, I I would like. I don't want anything that's more powerful because blue doesn't need more power. But I would like to have, I would like to have their stuff more play to the board because they're the color that is able to play the least to the board, and I like interaction in my magic. Mm -hmm. And I feel like blue has the ability to just sidestep all of that interaction to a greater degree than every other color. So having Aphidians is better than having Concentrates, in my opinion. Now, obviously, those two cards are different power levels, but I think you, you understand what I'm saying. I'd rather the, have, like... The play is more engaging for both players. Yes, exactly. Because then you have tension of, like, well, I need to... Am I using my counter spells and my tricks to keep my creatures alive, or am I stopping you from advancing your board state? Rather than saying, well, I don't really care what interaction you have with my stuff because I don't have any stuff, so I'm just going to bounce everything and counter everything. And I'll, use, I'll just use my powerful draw cards to continue to remain at, at hand parity. And I think I just want to go in the opposite direction. So, question is, how cheap can it be? And I don't think it should be one mana, but the point is, I think if there were more of those effects that were interesting, and Watcher of Tomorrow is a, actually, that, that's that's the name of the card, right? Yep. Well, uh, Watcher yeah. for or of. Watcher for, for or of. Watcher <laughs> for and or of Tomorrow. Um, the famous card with Hideaway, and as everyone knows, Hideaway means that the card comes into play tapped. Mm -hmm. Everyone of course, knows it. Everyone knows that. No need for a minor text. But I think that's actually a really good Aphidian-type card, too. It's not an Aphidian because it doesn't need to connect, but it provides card advantage on the board, although you're going to get that no matter what. Um, but just card, yeah, cards like that. That's where I would like blue to be angled towards rather than not having to interact. Yeah, definitely. And that goes, that, that goes I was going to say, that goes for every power level and every rarity level because that's mm -hmm. that's the case across common, common, uncommon, rare, up to vintage power level cubes yeah something that requires a little investment a little yep. play on the board waiting a turn getting paid off later exactly yep. something i uh, didn't mention in white this is something that i generally would like to see more of and they are doing more of which is awesome and i hope they continue to do more of is just giving more cards that have interesting or powerful abilities relevant creature types and specifically in ways that allow the non-base color to play well into the tribal support. So specifically for blue, some more zombies would be cool because there's a lot of black zombies, just some blue-black zombies, but there's very few blue zombies. So like if, if just some blue cards that cost one or two mana that had reasonable effects on their own were zombies, that would make me happy. Yeah. I am... 
always pro relevant creature types on stuff. I think there's very little reason to not do that. Just cross magic in general. Mm -hmm. We're getting to a point, and a commander has helped focus on this, where there always should be some sort of some sort of archetype or package that you can have if you're building a custom environment or like a commander deck where you can have a blank deck of what of, of basically insert creature type here that there's enough like tangential support to make that work. So uh, any, anything that is anything that is adding to that, I think is a bonus. Yes. So you're talking, speaking of zombies, <laughs> I assume that your request for black is just to make more zombies. Uh, zombies, vampires, demons. Uh, <laughs> more seriously, um, the big note that I have for black is when it's not keyworded, you don't have to pretend that black's keyword is devotion. Not every black card needs three black pips or to count the number of swamps you control. There's just <sighs> way too yeah. much of that all the time. And I get that it's flavorful, but we just need more cool, good black two drops that cost one colorless mana and one black mana. Um, yeah. Like, probably the best cube card to come out in black in a while is... Um, Oh god, the one mana one two vampire knight knight of the ebon legion knight of the ebon legion yes yep. as as soon as you said the best I was like knight of the ebon legion <laughs> yeah it's that card and it's like really not close no it's not close that card's awesome it's it's castable awesome and aggressive deck has play early has play late yeah that's exactly the kind of card I want to see more of yeah I totally agree I would like in in black black centric i would like to see more like combo oriented stuff where you know previously we were talking about with blue all of the, you know blue is the color that allows it to play the least to the board i would like some of that in a different way to move into black like i would love honestly and maybe it's just maybe i'm just thinking of wanting like more reanimator like low level reanimator stuff but I feel like having, being able to assemble like graveyard combos in black is something that I always want to do in cubes mm -hmm. and having more reasonable cards that go with those. So even something like, you know, like uh, if you're bringing something back, like bringing Murderous Red, Red Cap back, like in and out of the graveyard with a thing that is putting or preventing counters. So even, even something like uh, unspeakable symbol. Are you familiar with that card, Ryan? Uh, I am because I briefly owned a Marchesa of the Black Rose commander deck. Okay, got it. So unspeakable symbol for those that aren't, uh, it's a enchantment from Scourge. One black black, you just pay three life to put a plus one plus one counter on a creature. But I would just like something that I don't even know. I don't even know how to describe what I want. But I want I want that type of thing where you can you can make a combination of creatures entering the battlefield out of the graveyard or vice versa. Okay. More interesting to put together. So I I think I'm picking up what you're putting down here. So I'm gonna name a couple cards that kind of do. Do you know the card Bone Miser? Indeed I do. Four and a black. 4-4 four, four, does a thing when you discard a card. Yeah, so it does various things. Like if you discard a land, you get two black mana. If you discard a creature, you draw a card. I, I don't think that's yes. the exact text, but you do things when you discard cards. Correct. Uh, that, and then there's been a number of cards recently that have been printed that do something when a card or a creature card specifically leaves your graveyard. Um, so just more of that sort of thing that can play with a lot of cards that exist. Yes. For example, Haunted Dead plays really well with, with either of those effects, either something leaving your graveyard or discarding cards. So mm -hmm. more of these kind of engine-y cards that maybe have decent stats that would show up normally, maybe a relevant creature type to boot, and then can pay you off if your deck is very thematic. Yes, you got it. You did a much better explanation of what I was trying to say than I did. <laughs> Thank goodness you were here. 
That's why we're a team. Exactly. I'll forget. I'll 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 forget about Mudhole for now. Oh, bring it up uh, for now. Well, I was hoping to be the one to call for a functional mud hole <laughs> reprint when we got to red. But... <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> yeah, let's let's put it up with the times now. Now it can only cost one red mana, but it's still rare. <laughs> yeah, that, that just put put it to print. Okay, so anything else for what about anything else for black? Uh, those are the major thoughts I have. Just fewer black mana symbols on the cards is is the major note that I have. Okay. That's fair. Wait, what about red? So red has a lot of awesome stuff going on. I agree. Like, it's a really easy color to make beatdown good in. You have a lot of cool artifact matter stuff. You have a number of red rituals and combo cards like that, and interesting discard and draw effects, the rummage sort of things. Uh, Do you know the card Jessica's Will? I definitely do. So this is a sweet one. What what set is it even from? It's from a fake it's from set. Com- it's from Commander Legends. Commander Legends. So it's red and two for a sorcery, and you can either make a red mana for each card in an opponent's hand or exile the top three cards of your library. You can play them that turn. So that's even like a draw effect or ritual effect modal spell. So we're, we're getting a lot of stuff that gasses up combo. Uh, one thing that I would like to see more of, there's a lot of cool dragons, but they all cost four or more mana. We talked about on our Vintage Cube episode, you, literally, you, you specifically said you can change the five mana dragons in the middle of the game and it probably won't impact the outcome. It's true. And that, that's just true in a lot of yeah. spots. But I would like to see some one, two, three mana dragons that are playable. So give dragons the angel treatment that angels just got in call time. Yeah, exactly. Because that's exactly what happened. Like you could have, you could have previously said the same thing about angels, and then call time comes around, and now you have, you know, you have relevant angels from like every mana cost two and up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not every dragon needs to be ancient. They they were babies at one point. Yeah. Okay. And like I like why I like that. why is dragon whelp a four mana card? What's up with that? Uh, it's a beefy dragon whelp. <laughs> one of it's it's out of the out of the big bone clan. Of dragons. Gotcha. So I I think that red is has the most interesting hands in different buckets of stuff. And two things that I want to see more developed in red are uh, graveyard oriented stuff. Like I would love to see like some like very like brief. Uh, reanimation stuff that maybe gives something haste and then sacrifices it in a turn. Uh, because red always has to like go over to black for that type of thing. Okay, so you um, want some more different Felden of the third paths. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think I just think that's really interesting because red has red has so much like cycling type stuff. Not cycling, but you know, faithless looting and cathartic reunion and Things where you're able to go through your deck fast, and I think those cards are often very fun. And I think that there should be more that allows red to do stuff with putting in the do more with the stuff it's putting in the graveyard. That could either be reanimation or that could be caring about instants and sorcerers in the graveyard at a greater degree. You go either of those two paths. But I feel like they're just like barely like kind of touching their toe in the water there. And I would just like to see more generally playable cards that, that hit those angles. That's one thing that I want. For red. The yeah, second thing, the second thing, which it seems like they're doing is I really, really, really love uh, the fact that red is getting more treasures. Mm. I think treasures are really cool. And I think it's a very great way to do like fast, like burst mana for red, like something you don't get forever. Because then, then red can angle more into the artifact, artifacty portion of of cube design. Where right now you don't quite have enough to have red as like a fully functioning member. Like there's a, you you have a, you have a handful of things, but you can't have that as like a major theme throughout red unless you are specifically doing an artifact cube where everything is a, is about that. But just in a regular cube, I would love to have other cards that care about treasures. I actually think that there's a card. That is a very good example of this that I want in in this in uh, in Strixhaven. It's not priced to move for cube, 
but I think it's a I think it's going in the right direction. That's Storm Kiln Artist. Three in a red, Dwarf Shaman. It's a 2-2. Two, two. It gets plus one, plus one for each artifact you control, and it has Magecraft, so whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, you make a treasure token. Hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's, that's a nice a, like combo setup card, or even just honest yeah. artifacts laying around. Exactly, and I think that like it's like barely too expensive. I actually think that card would be really sweet if it costs like one mana less. Yeah, four is too much, but I, I like I like that they're like they're exploring that angle for red. And I wish I hope they continue to do that because those are like the graveyardy stuff and then the treasure stuff are the two things that I really want to see in red because I think that those are super duper interesting moving away from burn you play haste creature like that's fine that's always going to be available if they never print another burn spell or another haste creature that's cheap red will still be as good as it always has been unless they change people's starting life total to to more than 20 (laughs) those cards are always going to be good yes red can deal that much damage it is it is known yeah so those are the two things I would like for red. So you mentioned a dwarf. I actually have one last actually dwarf-related type of card on my wish list for red. Um, a card from Kaldheim that I think is really cool that could use a little bit more support is Magda. The I two knew you were going to say Magda. Dwarf legend. Whenever a dwarf becomes tapped, you make a treasure, and you can sacrifice five treasures to tutor up a dragon. How come there's no good one-mana dwarves? I don't care if they're red. I don't care if they're white. I just want them to exist. Yeah. I mean, this is like... This is this is pulling all three things together. Where you were talking about putting relevant creature types on stuff. I was talking about treasures. And then when we were dunking on Magda for taking the place of Earthshaker Kenner in the Vintage Cube. So it's just mm-hmm. rolling it all together. <laughs> yeah, it's cool when the cards are more thematic. Just support the theme. Yeah, I like Magda. I just don't like when Magda's the only dwarf in the whole cube. Right. Yeah, it's a cool. It's a very cool card. And then when you have five treasures, it doesn't matter what dragon you get because it's awesome no matter what. When you can sacrifice five treasures and tutor a dragon out of your deck. Yeah. Then I absolutely. don't care if it's Goldspan Dragon or Thunderball <laughs> Hellkite or Stormbred Dragon. I don't care. They're all great. Or at that if point. I select one and it just changes in the middle of the game, whatever. Yeah, sure. It literally at that point it doesn't matter because the opportunity cost of drawing it and casting it is gone. Yep. All right, cool. All right, green, last one. So green is a tough color in cube. Uh, for anyone listening, if you keep up on the cube evaluations, which I'll have one this week, I literally don't know at the time of recording what the Magic Online cube is coming up, but within the next 24 hours, I will know and will have written <laughs> slash be writing a breakdown of my initial thoughts on the cube. It comes up pretty often that I look over a cube and there are two things you really want to look out for. How easy it is to generate card advantage, how easy it is to generate extra mana. And a lot of cubes could use some tuning up in terms of balancing these things. And because of that, it is very common for me to say that green is the best color in a given cube. If Utopia Sprawl is in your cube, it is probably a top 10 card. Now that is a bold, bold If claim. it's a powered cube, no, that's not the case. Obviously, there's better mana fixing. But, like, if you just have a reasonable deck and your opponent opens up on Utopia Sprawl, the game is often over. You can play it out, but you'll get pretty similar results conceding at that point. I'm probably going to play it out. I just, don't, I just don't think I could... I don't think I could live with myself if someone just opened on Utopia Sprawl and I was like, shit, pack it in. <laughs> game game two. Hope you don't have that start again. You know what? That makes you part of the problem. Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe so. But I can't. I can't concede to you, Toby Stroll. I understand what you're saying because you can't kill it. What if you have? What if you have the strip mine? Then your opponent just concedes the match. Well, yeah. That, that's yeah. that's that's why the non-powered caveat was pretty important. Yeah, not fair. not just the moxin, but also literally getting strip mined. I was just saying, I can't emotionally come you. back from that. Oh, yeah, that would destroy you for playing Sprawl. But that, that speaks to a greater point where, like, that card is rarely appropriately powerful for an environment. Um, it's just sort of the thing, like, fast mana, it, it makes it so the game actions matter way less. If, if you're casting twos and I'm casting fours, what are we even doing here? Uh, it, it's unlikely that the game will really be competitive. So 
it's good to have some mana ramp because it can be really exciting. Like I like Birds of Paradise a good amount. And if that yeah. shows up in an environment that is about attrition, if there's a lot of removal spells on turn one for Birds of Paradise, great. Mm-hmm. You yep. have a game where the other deck maybe is making a relevant decision between playing a creature and destroying your Birds of Paradise. For you, there's a little bit of rolling the dice, having the birds in your opener versus drawing it later. There's some cool tension going on. Yep. In general, though, you got to be careful with Mana Ramp because it leads to a lot of non-games. Yeah. And something I would like to see is just green getting a little less mana ramp and a little more stuff that's just above rate or is a cheap thing that can grow to a big thing. Like my favorite recent green cube card is probably Hex Drinker. One mana, two one, good at attacking, blocking, not doing the Lanowar Elf thing, and then it grows into a progenitus later over time. Uh have you ever lost to a hex drinker when that is the only card your opponent has cast? I think they've cast other stuff, but I have played the game where it felt like it was the only thing that happened. Okay. Do you have Not a hex drinker that... story, or what? What's the nature of the question here? That's the whole story. They cast. <laughs> they cast on turn one. They cast on turn one, and. Uh... Uh, they didn't cast any more spells to kill me. I was yeah, playing. A, I was playing. A, I was playing a red aggro deck too, and I literally, I literally did not find a removal spell until it had protection from the removal spell. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that'll come up, but uh, I not even I would concede to turn one hex drinker. No, I didn't. I didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish that I had, uh, <laughs> because it, it. You know, there was a moment in time during that game probably around turn four when I realized I was going to lose to it. I just had not lost to it yet. And it really, it it felt bad because I was like, well, I just have to race it. And I'm saying this as like the the mono red deck. And I'm like, am I literally going to lose this Hexstringer? Like I just have all like creatures. And I just, I didn't, I I bricked. I had like a million lands in my hand, but like point being, they cast Hexstringer and kill me. I felt really bad. That's the second last time I've cubed too. Like in real life, so that one's still fresh, even though it happened like well over a year ago. <laughs> so you have a personal vendetta against Hex Drinker. I also just hate Hex Drinker because I said it was going to be bad when when it was printed. Oh, so, there it is. There yeah. it is. Well, I definitely undervalued not in, not in it. cube, not in cube. I actually thought it was okay. going to be very good in cube. Gotcha. I undervalued it as a cube card initially because I think like in pick order, I'm picking all the Lanowar Elves first, but turns out. Hex Drinker can take the four drop slot too, and it, it's a lot better with your Gaia's Cradle. So, Hex Drinker is the uh, Black Knight of the Ebon Legion. All right, yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good comparison. Yeah. All right, I want uh, more aggressive land payoff cards, much like you were talking about in the in the intro. Uh, I am a rare person that likes triples into card draft. I like to play my lands and get in there and kill you. So I really like having things that are are land, like having land payoffs or playing land payoff cards, but that are on the lower half of the curve rather than the top half of the curve. Because I think that makes a lot of very interesting deck building decisions and uh, playing decisions when you are trying to decide how you're going to order all of your your lands and spells and i think that green has a lot of land-based stuff so i don't think it would be too difficult to make some powerful cards that are in that kind of similar vein just make them aggressive creatures but if you they give you something when you play lands they have all of the effects they just have all of the effects on like larger creatures with higher mana cost and i just want to move those down it is frankly insulting that white gets step links and green gets uh sight territorial or whatever. They got territorial bailoff in that cycle. Five mana four four. <laughs> well even With like the, the battle effect. for Zendikar, like when they did the second Zendikar block, they paid homage, they made a green landfall one drop, but it only got plus one plus, plus one, one plus one plus one. Yeah. What what is that? Like why? Just yeah, that that's really all that I want. The, honestly, all that I want for green, because I think that green has probably the second most 
tools behind blue across everything available for a color. So I don't think it needs a whole lot more, but I think that would be a, a cool angle for them to shoot. Hmm. Yeah, I, I would love for more cubes to have green one-drops that aren't just mana accelerants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would be sweet, like... I don't know. Some, I guess they're... And th so this is where, like, the the constructed portion comes in. But I don't care. Again, I don't care about constructed. You ruin a format. That's fine. Print something, make... Ruin then two. Ruin two. Who cares? <laughs> I'm willing to sacrifice them. You'll, f you'll think of new ones. People always think of new formats. What's the difference? <laughs> Just give me those cards for cubed. Figure it out. Again, you got three years. I don't think I'm being too, too, too picky with that. Yeah, that's plenty of time. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, anything else for green or any other color for that matter before we move on? Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of like uh, my, my general wish list sort of stuff. Um, big note, more tribal stuff. Love stuff that's about combat. Big part of that is the creatures being cheap. Yeah. Cheap with, le with, with few pips. Yes, yes. Cheap and castable in multicolor decks. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's all I want too. At the end of the day, I just I, I love I love seeing that generic mana. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and be back in just a minute. What's up, gamers? Taking a quick break from the pod here to let you know about the upcoming magic set, Strixhaven School of Mages. Strixhaven is the most elite university in the multiverse. That means more elite than Talarian Academy. That means more elite than Wizard School from Homelands. It's got them all beat. It features five colleges which battle it out with their own takes on magic. And from what we know about the set, that means we're going to see heavy representation of all five enemy color pairs. And for my money, that means blue red cards. Obviously, it means wizards. There's more than enough to sell me already just there. And you can pre-order your Strixhaven seal products now. Go to starcitygames.com slash previews to do so. Strixhaven School of Mages. Magic goes to college. Ryan, you may have heard of the set Strixhaven, School of Mages. Magic goes to college? Yes, <laughs> even though the tagline, great. <laughs> so this is a set that is largely focused on the enemy colored pairs with the five magic schools or colleges. I don't remember exactly which one. Probably Magic Goes to College, so I'm going to say colleges, using context yes. clues here. I had to read the copy a couple of times, but I'm pretty sure it's colleges. <laughs> okay. Now, this is very... We are recording this very, very early in preview season. And when this comes out, we said at the top of the show, you folks are going to know more than we do. So we've just grabbed a handful of cards that we just want to talk about before next week when we have the entire list of all of the cards in Strixhaven. And then we're going to take a much deeper dive, but we just have a few for this week. So if yes. we're not talking about a card, it probably doesn't exist yet. Just keep that in mind. Be very gentle with us. <laughs> so uh, which one, what do, you, what do you want to start with? I mean, let, let's start with the champs card. Yeah. Shout out to world cha reigning world champion, Paulo Vitor Damodarosa, elite spellbinder. We alluded to a little yeah. bit, but let's go with the text box now. It's two and a white. It's a human cleric, I believe. Indeed. It's a 3-1 flyer. And when an ETBs, you look at an opponent's hand, you exile a card from that hand, a non-land card, and that player can cast that card, but from now on it costs two more mana. And this is not conditional on lead Spellbinder being on the battlefield. You kill the Spellbinder, the card is still taxed. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. I, I had to read that a couple of times to make sure that it didn't return to their hand if this died, and it does not. Yeah, I think that that's probably where a lot of initial cold reviews on the card come in, because this hits a lot of the notes. Like, three mana is, is a little heavy for cube needs. Like, this is replacing something that's probably reasonably good in your cube, but I think it's going to be worth a slot in a lot of spots. And I you think have... this is going to be more interesting in whatever you're replacing in most cases. Yeah, very good shot of that. You know, look like getting the information from looking at the opponent's hand is a pretty cool mechanic. 
taxing something as a relevant impact on gameplay. A lot of thought goes into how you want to play that. And for the opponent, too, now trying to cast a card that costs two more mana, fitting that into their curve. Um, relevant creature types, both a human and a cleric. Um, I am hoping that we get more party stuff fleshed out. I'm pretty excited to design around party as a major cube focus in the future. Mm-hmm. Three one flyer for three. That's pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, historically, three one with evasion for three has always th- those cards find find to be more playable than not. I yes. would say when you have that stat line. So. And, and you have a relevant ability tacked on. I think that we're probably going to see more party in the Dungeons & Dragons set comes out next, if I had to guess. If if not, I'd, I, I guess I don't understand Dungeons & Dragons <laughs> if there's no party in that set. Yes, that is my expectation and my desire. Yeah. No, I really like Elite Spellbinder. I think this is, you know, this is kind of what we were talking about with like interesting white design. Boom, right there. Yeah. This more card of that. is awesome. More of that, please. Uh, so there's another card that was previewed that you had just a scorching take on <laughs> on Twitter, as I was alluding to in the intro. Rip Apart. Red, white. Choose one. Rip Apart deals three damage to target creature or planeswalker, just, or destroy target artifact or enchantment. And it is a sorcery. Uh, love yourself enough to ask for more. I don't know. I don't know how other people have been engaging with magic through this era of fire, have been around through actually really pushed cards over the years, have watched a major dynamic shift to most successful competitive decks being about pressing advantages on the battlefield with card advantage or positional advantages that can play at instant speed or at least at sorcery speed pay you off a lot and think, yeah, a sorcery speed one for one's exactly what I need. Like, it's it's flexible card, don't get me wrong. I think yeah. it's gonna show up in some capacity and construct it. And I think that if your cube environment cares about the card disenchant, then it's a reasonable consideration. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Yeah. So, like, I'd, I'd probably put this in the Moto Vintage cube. However, even there, it's going to be played in more Jeskai decks than Boros decks. Oh, like you, for sure. You can't target players with this, which is the big thing that an aggressive deck would care about. Playing at sorcery speed means that you have to wait around for a target to show up. So sometimes this is just going to be in your hand, and maybe you didn't commit anything to the battlefield. Maybe you left some mana stranded. Your opponent plays something. You have to untap and cast this, which taxes your ability to commit another threat to the battlefield on that turn the card is more done like it reads as more powerful than it is is my initial impression of it it's going to show up some spots but i am personally just not really excited at all about the card so i i I like the card in general but i agree with your sentiments about its lore holdness slash borosness ultimately to me this seems like a card that is going to be in non-red-white decks that cost you a red and a white mana to cast. Because I think the most effective way to remove, if you're in a mono-red deck, I think Lightning Bolt is more efficient at removing enchantments from the battlefield than this card is. Yeah, when you kill your opponent, they take all their enchantments with them. Exactly. I mean, that's exactly right. And, like... I actually think that this card would be perfectly reasonable and would be an interesting inclusion if it was an instant, and it's not. And that is the major killer for me. It's actually not the fact that it can't go face. But if if I have to, as an aggressive deck, if I have to tap out on my turn to do this for such a minimal effect, because this is just like a small removal spell. Yeah. Which is... It doesn't make a big difference to me which it is. Like, if they want to make it go upstairs or let you play at an instant speed, the fact that both of those on, that seems like deliberately powering the card down. Like, this card seems carefully balanced when a lot of people are claiming it's very pushed. It's it's just not very pushed. It's Yeah, you're exactly right. I would take one of those two. It could either be an instant, as is, or deal three damage to any target. And I don't think that's too much to ask because then it's just then it's just lightning bolt that costs you a white mana, but that's also fine because you get the flexibility of disenchant along with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that this will appear in lower level, lo- lower power level cubes, and I think it will be good there because this is a lot of flexibility for a 
a pauper cube or a peasant cube. Uh, a peasant cube. Peasants, uncommon and uncommon. So, peasant cube that you won't need in a more powerful environment. But I, I think that most of the time, you're not going to be drafting this in the deck it looks like it was designed to go into. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's this is more of a Jeskai card than it is a Boros card. Yep. Yeah, if your deck is trying to play a kill spell on turn two or just answer what your opponent is up to, whether it's a creature or a signet, you'll get up to this. If your deck's yeah. a beatdown deck, you're going to cast a creature on turn two. That's yeah, you're not you going to find time. You're not going to find time to do this because you never want to take off your turn. I imagine a lot of people are going to try this in their cube, and I think that they should. I just anticipate people will be more disappointed than they're expecting. Yeah, and it's like, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't and think like, it's a bad card. I don't yeah. think it's a bad card. And, and, and fine is enough, especially if you have a slot that you're not really excited about. And there is value in showing up specifically in Jeskai decks. That's not a bad thing. It's just like this card is not really moving mountains as it it's seems to be proclaimed. It's disappointing yeah. for me for a two-color combination that I feel to be the shallowest in cubes. Yes, yeah, Boros is really hurting for both cards that are powerful and cards that do dynamic things. And specifically, if you want to talk about uh, a good example to talk, to really highlight the issues with Boros in the Magic Online Vintage Cube. It is very good to draft mono white aggressive decks, and I'm I'm told that it's still very good to draft mono red aggressive decks. They did see a lot of success in the in the mocks. I personally have struggled with them for a bit of time, but they they still perform pretty well from what I understand. But both decks do a lot worse when you have to play both colors. Like, Boros yeah. just performs worse than Mono White and Mono Red. And having to play Plateau is actually a detriment to your Mono Red or your Mono White card, and this deck does not make up for that. Yep. We mostly talked about Mono Color in the Wishlist section, but I would really like to see a 3-mana Boros Planeswalker. And I'm not super particular about what it does. Like, I don't need a Dak Phaeton level power level, but something even just like a Royal Scions power level that can impact combat, maybe gives you card selection in some capacity, maybe interacts with a problematic permanent type, or can exchange resources with the opponent that builds up to an ultimate. I think that that's the kind of card I really want to see for Boros. Hot take. Uh, the Royal Scions is significantly more interesting than Deck Faden in, in any cube that it could go in. Yeah, I mean, I think Deck Faden is... Really bad play patterns. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And hopefully it seems like, you know, just from the early stuff that we've seen, it seems like there may be some more interesting red and white cards in this set, and we will have to check back next week to get confirmation on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? What what you got? Card that I am very personally excited for, and I think is actually going to play more broadly well in cube than a lot of cards that specifically are interesting to me, but I really like Elite Spellbinder. It is a green card, one and a green as a 2-2 two -two human druid. It has Magecraft, that's the new keyword that triggers on you casting an instant or sorcery or copying an instant or sorcery. So when you Magecraft, you put a plus one, plus one on your Dragon Guard Elite. And then it has some uh, flavor text for four and green, green. You can double the number of plus one, plus one counters on it. I'm sure you'll do that sometimes. It's never really going to be what the game is about. But I really like Quirion Dryad. There's a Merfolk that does a similar thing. This two mana green creatures that get counters when you do stuff tends to be casting spells. It's Deep Root Deep champion. Root Elite or Champion. Deep Root Elite is one a of those champion. Two. Okay. No, <laughs> deep, I think it's Champion. Elite is the one that puts 1-1 one, one counters on Merfolk when you cast a Merfolk. Yes, yeah, Deep Root Champion. Um, yeah. So those cards were 1-1s, one -ones, and they're really solid if you're trying to make green overlap well with other colors. If you're doing like a spell matter theme, you can put green in with like Blossoming Defenses and Vines of Vastwood, and then other colors will have cantrips, and they'll play pretty well together. I really like Joel Rail, the 2-mana 1-2. Yeah. When you draw a second card, it makes a 2-2 two -two token. It's another cool yeah. card for these. I'm a big fan of that too, that card specifically. Yeah, and then Dragon's Guard Elite, like, starting as a Grizzly Bear, that's actually a big deal. 
Like, you don't have to cast that many spells for this card to be awesome. If you, if you cast a Serum Visions and a Lightning Bolt, it's already yeah. a 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, 4-4 four, four for 2 mana is huge with other spells you are already going to cast. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's actually the thing I was going to say is this starting at a 2-2. Two, two, and I consider the 6 mana effect, which is uh, 4 green green, double the number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on Dragon Guard Elite. I consider that flavor text, but... Joral has that flavor text too, and you can also just kill your opponent with that. So I feel like in green, those are, are generally more than flavor text, and they come up more frequently than you, you might think. That's true. Yeah, you'll commonly be playing some cards that make that mana threshold more reasonable. Mm -hmm. And unlike Joral, there's no reason to do that at, in, at the end of your opponent's turn. This is not the case here. You literally turn this into a you know, one shot creature if it if it gets through. True. Uh I like the the fact that this is a two two. As someone who has played the deck Miracle Grow to the point where I've literally written Miracle Grow down on a PTQ, you know, deck form, where that was the name of the deck, truly the name of the deck almost twenty years ago. I'm always happy to see these creatures and how they have evolved. And I think this is I think this is one of the better ones. And mm -hmm. Kind of the opposite with Rip Apart. I think that this card will play significantly better than it looks for people that are not super familiar with this effect. Yeah, and if uh, you have not tried this before, go ahead. Yeah, I talked about earlier black having a problem where the cards aren't splashable because of there's just too many pips in them. Another thing that impacts splashability are the effects working with other colors. And this is a great example of a card that's generally easy to cast. You only need one green mana to do it. And it just plays really well with blue or red. And hopefully, you know, you'll get some more white and or black stuff that play better with Magecraft. It seems like the set is contributing a lot to that. But even if you don't mm -hmm. get it, if you're trying to employ a Spells Matter, a Prowess, a Magecraft theme, just having cards that are decent if you're not really pushing it and can be very powerful if you are pushing the theme is awesome. Yeah, definitely. We're also now getting to the point of there's now enough of these where this is kind of a relevant thing. Where you could actually make this like a little subsection of green and that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. So let's briefly talk about the command cycle, which was actually the first set of cards that were previewed. Uh, do you have any one, any one or two in particular that you feel like are, are above average compared to the rest? I'm going to answer a slightly different question than the one you asked. I'm okay. going to say that my favorite and my belief the most powerful command certainly for cube is blue green quandrix command i love that one okay and i think that blue red prismari command is incredibly overrated out of the gates wow i am i'm opposite Ooh. i feel differently i think that quandrix command is is good but it's i think in a lot of i think it's just going to be at best average compared to any other blue green card you could be casting and i think prismari command does a lot of what any blue green excuse me any blue red deck in any cube because a lot of them are often very similar with kind of spell slingy stuff maybe not fully spell slingy but a lot of instants and sorceries and kind of efficient creatures it seems like it's kind of exactly what you want in a lot of cases I think if you're playing an environment that is heavy on two toughness creatures and artifacts, so Prismari Command, that those are some of the modes you can do two, two damage to any target, draw two cards, then discard two cards, make a treasure token, destroy an artifact. I think if you are consistently getting a card that is worth three mana to target with a shock or a shatter, this card goes up in value significantly. Yeah decent chance that, that this card plays really solidly in Vintage Cube. And, like, it's a fine card for an attrition, more like attrition-based Grixis Cube. I don't hate it. Um, I, I do think that uh, probably what got me cold on this card is it got a, a lot of initial 
comparison is to Cole against Command, and I think it's much weaker than Cole against Command. It is a lot weaker than Cole against Command. I was not going to make that comparison. Yeah. So um, tell me why, because I think some of the reasons that you think that Prismari Command is not as powerful or are, are going to be matched by the reasons I don't think Quandrix Command is as powerful. So, so sell me on that one. So I expect the situations where you can get at least a card and a specifically a good card or a turn's worth of tempo off of Condrix Command are very common. I think that it's going to be true of more environments when you take this combination of abilities. So it's an instant for one green-blue, choose two, return a creature or planeswalker to its owner's hand, counter an artifact or enchantment spell, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature, or target player shuffles up to three cards from their graveyard into the library. You'll get a spot where bouncing a creature or planeswalker, where countering an artifact or enchantment, or where putting two plus one plus one counters on a creature mm -hmm. will set your opponent back an entire turn of development. You're eating a creature in combat, you're countering some significant artifact or enchantment, you're bouncing their blocker or their planeswalker, or doing two of these things at once. And even shuffling cards in the graveyard, that can come up. There's a lot of stuff that matters in the graveyard in cube, like... That, that ability probably comes up more often than players would think it would at first blush. And I think yeah. that all three of the other abilities are actually very good. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this, I think both of, both Prismari and Quandrix commands have a, their fourth mode, not in, not in order of reading on the card, but their fourth mode is like the one that's going to come up the least, but will still come up, which is the making the treasure and then the shuffling the part of the graveyard. Mm -hmm. I feel like if, for the same reason that, if you feel like the counter target artifact or enchantment, if that's relevant, the destroying an artifact is going to be similarly relevant in the same cube environment. Yeah, that, that's unless you true. know of a cube environment that there's like way more enchantments than there are artifacts, because I'm not familiar with one. <laughs> it does not does not come up too often. You'll see that. Um, the, the big thing for me though is that I think that putting two plus one plus one counters on a creature is going to lead to more relevant interaction advantages, being being it outsizing an opponent's creature, finishing off a planeswalker, then have something left over, than shock is going to. Yeah, sure. I don't disagree. I actually like, that's my favorite mode on that card, is the two plus one plus one counters. Because mm -hmm. I think that has the highest return when it's going to be cast. Uh, I also think that you might be discounting the target player draws two cards and discards two. I've played Is It Charm, Justin. It's horrible. It's, but this isn't, is, you know, this isn't Is It Charm. Is It Charm <laughs> is just do that. It's just do that and then be sad about it. That is true. Those are the if two you, modes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it Charm, Is It Charm plus Shock or Is It Charm plus Shatter, I think is, is, is pretty solid because you're not stuck with just doing that. Is It Charm is do one of those things. Is It Charm is just Shock or, or just draw two, discard two. And, and th th like, th I feel like touching on Colgon's command, only not current Colgon's command, but when Colgon's command was previewed, I feel like that was the argument people were making to say, well, Colgon's command wasn't good. Because I've played Raise Dead, I've played blah, blah, blah. Well, like, we know that the, the, that the combining these effects make it significantly more powerful. And I think that having, having the flexibility of this, because I like this card in pretty much any blue-red deck. Like there's not a blue red deck you could you could imagine that I don't think this card is great in legitimately. Now, so here's here's how I would frame it. Okay. Would you rather have Prismari Command in the average deck, or would you rather have Electrolyze? I would, I would rather have Prismari Command. Okay. Okay. We'll come back to this one on a later episode because I am firmly in the electrolyzed camp currently. Well, I got that. <laughs> I figured that one out. Did I make that clear? Yeah. I mean, I, I like Quandrix Command. I think, okay, I think these are the best two. But you don't like Prismar Command. You think it's the worst one, which... Uh, I'm, mo most uh, overrated. Most overrated. I might have said worse. What I meant was most overrated. Uh... I don't know. We'll get the editor to make sure that you said worse. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll we check the to. tape, and yeah. then whatever I said will, will be binding because no one is allowed to misspeak. No, or change their mind. Yeah, changing your <laughs> mind is illegal. 
you know, what you say, how dare you get new information and then, <laughs> then change your opinion? <laughs> uh, I mean, I like both of these cards. I just think that... I think from your description, it's it sounds like you draft a lot more aggressive blue-green decks than I do. I mean, that's probably true. <laughs> okay, well, there's something to be said for that then. But I I mean, anyway, the other the other ones, uh, I think the black white I think Silver Quill Command is horrible. I think it's just awful. That's the black white one. Yeah, that yeah. one's a, some of them are sorceries. That one's a sorcery. That one's a, sor a big old four big old four mana sorcery. I cannot imagine putting that one in a cube. It's the the fact that it, once you get to four mana, you're competing with so many other things, mm -hmm. and you're already competing with like other removal options. And this is like the the only piece of removal on this is target opponent sacrifice a creature, but it's at four mana, which is not even remotely close to how much you want to be paying for that effect, regardless of what else you're getting. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm fully off of quote silver quill command, which is the black white one. Uh. Witherbloom Command, I think, is fine, but it's also a sorcery, which makes me like it less. But I think it's, I think it's still cubable if you have a large, multicolored section. Yeah, this one I want to like. That's that's how I feel. I, I don't know if I'm there, but I I want to like Witherbloom Command. Um, Lorehold Command is i'll go back and read these since we haven't read these so uh silver quill command two black white sorcery choose two target creature gets plus three plus three gets flying to in a turn return target creature with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield target player draws a card and loses a life and target opponent sacrifices a creature stinky uh, <laughs> wither bloom command black green sorcery choose two target player mills three cards and then you return a land card from your graveyard to your hand Destroy target non-creature, non-land with uh, mana value two or less. Target creature gets minus three, minus one until end of turn. Not until the end of your next turn, which I would have rather it said. Or target player loses two life and you gain two life. Well, minus three, minus one until end of turn is an ability that's way more interesting on an instant. Like, or uh, appealing, rather. Yeah, or on an instant or at least until your next turn. Mm-hmm. Doing it on your turn, I don't know. I mean, you're going to do this when you can kill a one toughness creature, and I don't think you're doing it much else. Unless you're playing those undersized green creatures <laughs> that are that commonly make their way into cubes. Um, so I don't know. You know I'm not I'm not sold on that one. And the final the final command. Is Lorehold Command, three red white instant, choose two. Create a three, two red and white spirit creature token. Creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and indestructible and haste until end of turn. Lorehold Command deals three damage to any target. Target player gains three life. And then finally, sacrifice a permanent, draw two cards. This is another one of those cards that's just not going in any Boros deck. Like, it's I think just, that there's a lot of merit to these abilities, but uh, it's I'm five minutes just too much. It. Yeah, five minutes is too much. Savannah deck. <laughs> yeah, I I actually like this card, but I the mana cost is too prohibitive. It's just too much. It's a lot. Yeah, it's too bad because I think this is like a relatively interesting card, but I would never, I'd never pay five mana to do this. So, makes it eliminates it from from there for me. We'll come back sell. to this. We'll come back to this Prismari versus Quandrix command at some point in the future. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm. Sh I'm confident it will come up. There's. There's just like no way that these cards don't show up in a bunch of cubes. Actually, what's probably going to happen is they're going to update all of the Magic Online cubes, and they're all going to have Prismari command, and none of them are even going to have Quandrix command, and then you'll win by default. Yeah. Well, you know what? Winning by default. Uh, still winning. Still winning. As it says in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last thing to talk about for, for Strixhaven previews this week, the Snarls. 
How do you feel about the Schnarls, Ryan? It is the perfect name. Over time, it is only more perfect. So I didn't even read the names of these cards. This is a land cycle. And I saw that they were continuing the cycle of the Shadow Lands from Shadows Over Innistrad. So they're lands that tap for one of two colors. They enter the battlefield tapped unless you can reveal a basic land of the corresponding colors from your hand. So Shine Shadow Snarl, which is impossible to say, is the black-white one. It taps for black or white. To have it enter the battlefield untapped, you have to reveal a plains or a swamp from your hand. I guess I might have said basic. They don't have to be basics. They just have to have the types. But anyway, if you've ever played with a card of this type, you will understand why I didn't bother to learn the names. These lands are pretty weak. Now, there's reasons to have dual lands that are weaker than others, specifically if you want to have mana fixing but don't want people to play three, four, five color decks, then deliberately putting in weaker dual lands makes sense. But make no mistake, these are weaker dual lands, and they are just definitely snarls. So you may have been familiar with these cards when they were called uh, Port Town and Friends from Shadows Over Innistrad. And people were not excited about those then. They played in Constructed, you know, where you can have an infinite number of lands to reveal to these, uh, as, as appropriately as you would think, meaning they got played because there were virtually no other options. And what they've done now is they have changed the name. They're now the Schnarls. And they've changed the art so they're these kind of twisty, spinny, magic-y looking things. And people seem to be excited by them. But they've really just taken something bad and then just put, you know, some pretty makeup and a and a and a nice wig on it. They have polished some turds. Yeah. The arts um, look great, by the way. Yeah, they I look love awesome. The arts. They look awesome. I think the names are cool. They're better than Port Town and Foreboding Ruins, which those could be just anything. But <laughs> they don't they're gonna play the same. What if they were called Port Snarl and Foreboding Snarl? Snarl. <laughs> I would be more interested. I would be more retconned, interested. I, think. Uh, I mean, they might as well. But <laughs> I just, I think that, you know how we were talking about, like, we're, a few weeks ago we were talking about the Pathway Lands, and I'm like, oh, it's really great. There's ten. I think these are worth exploring. <laughs> and uh, I don't feel that way about these. Oh, weird. I think that everything that Ryan said is true, and he was being generous, in my opinion. <laughs> I think I think these these mostly suck. These, uh, like they're good in your opening hand. They're great in your opening hand. I think that the strongest attachment to them that I have is that I am really coming around and saying the word <laughs> snarl, snarl as often as possible. Yeah, that's gonna be great for coverage. Much better than Port Town. <laughs> okay, anything else this week? for Strixhaven. We're going to be back next week and we're going to spend a lot more time on it. Yeah, we're kind of combing through and it's probably previews coming out as we speak. I think we Almost should certainly. save that for when, when it's all up. All right, sounds good. All right, in that case, we're going to take our last break and be back in a moment. Listen up, gamers. Taking a break from the pod to let you know how you can qualify for the Strixhaven Championship. That's right, the SEG Tour Online is back, and we're giving away cash prizes, tens of thousands of MTG Arena gems, MTG Arena Weekend Qualifier Invitations, and Strixhaven Championship Invitations. Go to SEGTourOnline.StarCityGames.com for event information. The road to the Strixhaven Championship begins here with the SEG Tour Online. All right, so before we go, I want to get your overall thoughts on the color pairs that are present in Strixhaven, the enemy colored pairs, and what you kind of feel about them in cube and like what they might, you know, over their overall direction, what they are, what they have, and what they might be lacking. Sure. So we have the enemy color pairs. I guess we'll just go down the list as we have them here. Boros, red, white, lore hold, as they're calling it. So kind of the big thing, it's true of the Magic Online Vintage Cube, as we say, and it's also true of a lot of cubes. Boros aggressive decks struggle as compared to either of the mono colors that make up Boros decks. 
And there's some interesting, there's some good tools when you get into a three color deck, but it's really difficult to come up with a convincingly good Boros control deck. And you're already playing good monocolor aggro decks. So the draw to Boros often just really isn't there. And I think that Boros really just needs some more flagship cards. I mentioned earlier, I, I really just want a three mana Boros Planeswalker that, that moves the needle. Doesn't have to be broken, just has to be playable. Just give me a taste. I think, I think that that's a very good design to add to Boros. Uh, something that is somewhat problematic for Boros designs is a lot of the creatures that they push for Boros end up costing three mana. And there's just a really heavy saturation of three mana creatures. Even if we're just talking about mono red and mono white aggressive decks. I think that really you need to see stuff that's more heavily thematic, that costs two, or if we can find a way, just give us another Boros hybrid one drop, give us another figure of destiny. Like you almost need to have that to make it particularly compelling. That's a lot. It's a lot to ask for. It's a big ask. It's a big ask. Yeah, I, I really just want, I would love for Boros to be able to branch out beyond doing attacky and blocky stuff. And it seems like, as I'm kind of scrolling through the, the previews that have been done, uh, one of which has come out since this podcast started, but it, they may be moving in somewhat that direction. It looks like that in Strixhaven, Lorehold cards uh, seem to care about the graveyard a bunch, which is really great. That's something I was asking for just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Maybe that's a different direction that they could go. But ultimately, what does that mean? And like, how do you fight getting those cards into your cube, making them relevant enough to compete with the aggressive cards? And I think that's going to be difficult. And it's probably going to have to happen over time when you get a, a larger number of those cards to exist. It's probably going to have to be more than just one set, I would imagine. Right. There's some kind of wacky designs. It looks like Magecraft is very much going to go over all five colors, which makes sense. We're, mm -hmm. we're at Magic College. The Boros stuff's a little weird. It looks like they queue off both spells and spirits on creatures that themselves are not spirits. So it looks like they're, from the cards we've seen so far, not necessarily trying to push that. We'll come back when we have the full set. Maybe there is something awesome in there. But uh, something that was like that, but is actually playable, would be desirable. What about uh, your 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 most hated color combination, Ryan? Blue red. You despise it, <laughs> based based exclusively on how you feel about Prismari Command and nothing you've ever said about blue and red cards before today. So blue and red, I mean, kind of the thing is that you have really good footings in control decks and combo decks. And you have some stuff for aggro decks. You have some decent support for prowess decks, like Sprite Dragon was a pretty solid upgrade for that. That doesn't really show up too much in higher-powered cubes, but it's definitely a nice one for lower-powered environments. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 have, you have a lot of cards that are very much worth the text box. I'm never disappointed. Like When I'm building a cube, I'll do a scryfall search for cards that match this color pair, and I almost never really even need to do the search for the blue-red cards just because there's <laughs> enough of them, A, that I know, and B, that are just good enough in enough environments. So I'm not really wanting for a lot in blue-red, but just on the more general notes for blue and the color red, some stuff that was a little bit cheaper and more combo-y would be kind of nice. Some stuff that uh, played well in prowess decks that maybe even scaled all the way up to the high power cubes, that'd be cool too. There's been a heavy influx of like six mana storm payoffs lately and some stuff that's a little bit cheaper would be nice to see. Like I like Thousand Year Storm probably more than the next person, but uh, casting it and actually getting another turn has proven difficult from time to time. Yeah. Look, uh, my best friend is Ali Antrazi, so I've, li I've, I've listened to a lot of Thousand Year Storm stories in my life. <laughs> he knows a thing or two about casting a spell that costs too much mana and trying to untap. Indeed. Indeed he does. <laughs> One of his hallmarks. So I, I also feel, I feel like, I feel like honestly of all of the enemy colored pairs, blue red is the most solidified of what it is and what it's doing. And it's able to do it in an interesting way. And mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's always good to ask for more because why would we not? But yeah, they're, they're printing sets anyway. 
Yeah, they're putting the cards anyway. Yeah, everybody's getting something. Yeah. So, but I think I think Blue Red is in in, in mostly good shape, even up to Prismari Command, which uh, one of us loves and one of us hates. So, <laughs> so now I hate it. I hate well, it. Uh, so moving on to green blue, which I think two years ago would have been probably said as one of the most boring two color combinations, uh, where previously all of their, uh, multicolored cards have largely been about plus one, plus one counters on creatures. And now, (laughs) now it's about, uh, extremely powerful cards, uh, relative to their mana cost. I think is that's their new theme. Yeah, if you're trying to do something that isn't totally broken or directly involving plus one, plus one counters, it's it's really tough to get enough blue and green cards. And I think that we have a nice start on some actual, just reasonable power level blue green cards before it was like unplayably bad or totally broken. Uh, funny story, I accidentally uh, put Inoko Thief of Crowns through my washing machine today and... Oh, I don't, God. I don't, I don't miss it. If there's any other card, I might feel more, but like, who cares? We'll let that silence hang for a minute. <laughs> we'll let the listeners determine if they believe you or not. It's, it's a true story. I don't care if you believe it. It happened. Well, I, I believe that you put it through the washing machine. That wasn't the part I was talking about. Them believing <laughs> whether I care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um i think that i think that i mean blue and green is just like big creatures vacant land drops i don't know more creatures blue and green does everything what did blue and green not do direct damage is that it oh there's probably some other stuff but that, that's that's, that's off the, the top of your off the top of your head uh they don't <laughs> destroy lands but they do bounce them sometimes so yeah, but they kill you with lands. They do that. They they can they can animate lands. I don't know. I don't feel like. Well, it's also just a thing where like the individual green and blue cards, you can make mana and you can draw cards, so you'll win somehow. Yeah, you'll figure it out. It might not be with the blue and green cards that got you there, but it'll be with something. Yeah, tropical island and breeding pool are <laughs> the best blue and green card. Yeah, by a lot. Okay, uh, black and white. This is a color pair I actually quite like because it's always like, I feel like this is like in it, in and of itself is like all of the best removal, mm-hmm. period. And that's yeah. that's the case with re- whatever cube that you are looking at. Doesn't matter. The rarity type of the cube, the the power level type of the cube, even if it's like some like set cube, black white is just gonna be the it's just generally the best removal. Yeah, you're talking about historical like cube all time. You get vindicate and destroy anything, whatever you yeah. want. Uh black black white is another color pair where it's not that hard to get five 10 gold slots like there's a lot of powerful designs mm-hmm. some of them are pretty generic like vindicate but yeah generic is going to be what you want in something like a, a powered cube and even if you're just not sure what you're doing just putting in something generically powerful in that slot until you find something more thematic is also great like you don't have that option in every color pair that's true <laughs> so yeah. it's something to be grateful for yeah yeah there's there's plenty there's vindicate anguish and making even like utter end there's always just placeholder cards that will see play and not be embarrassing when mm-hmm. you're cubing with them. Definitely. And white and black have some really cool things going on with like human tribal. That's one of the tribes that's really easy to seed into all five colors. And specifically Definitely. white and black gives you some awesome options for that. You don't really get too many white zombies or white vampires. There's a little bit there. That's something I'd like to see more of over time. Don't think we're going to see any of that sort of thing in Strixhaven, but uh, that's my long-term wish list. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, I think that it's all, it's, I really would like for uh, kind of the tricky creaturey stuff to be more in black, white. There's, we, we talked about that more in, in, in white when we were talking earlier when we were talking about uh, elite spell binder. That's that the one. one. Excellent. Um, but I really like, you know, it's got it's got uh, Mesmeric Fiend and Tide Hollow Sculler and things like that. 
that that are often in black white decks along with like thalias and stuff and i think i think that's a more fun angle and like ryan said pushing that towards the the humans as well i think would i think is something that black white often does very well i always try humans and i really just want it to be i want it to be better i feel like we're just like a couple of cards off of it really being a really great theme it's a good theme right now but it's not i feel like it's not yeah. great yet you need to be pulling for a cu- from a couple other spots. Um, I, I, I have some like notes on things that really work for humans. Um, there's some other stuff you want to scale back. It's definitely not there for like vintage or legacy cube. That that much is definitely true. Yeah. All right, last one: black green. The Golgari, or what are they called? Witherbloom. The Witherbloom. Witherbloom. That's right. There's a lot of pretty sweet green and black cards. Some of them have not aged as well as others. Maelstrom Pulse is a really nice piece of the removal. Pernicious Deed, that one uh, kind of bad play pattern is kind of not what it used to be. But you get a lot of good role players in Golgari. J- just like Orzov, you have like Abrupt Decay and Assassin's Trophy, which can easily be placeholders. And you get mm-hmm. a ton of stuff if you have a graveyard theme. That's where it can really open up. Yep. You get, like, Delirium, which came out in a set where, like, some of the very pushed cards from there, like Grim Flayer, is actually a really solid cube card if you're supporting that kind of thing. Definitely. Ishkana, definitely. Graph Wig- Widow, uh, Spider Spawning. I love Ishkana, yeah. Yeah. Spider, so like, yeah. So spider Spawning is, I feel like that's always a favorite of people trying to do, especially if you're in a lower power cube, because the graveyard mattering stuff, as far as the... The cards that put the cards in your graveyard are always at lower rarities. So you mm-hmm. can still do that. You can still accomplish those things even in common on common cubes, which I think is always really awesome. Yeah, and that, that's one that it can show up in various power levels. Like like you said, in common on common, you still get a lot of the really good enablers. And then the spider spawning is actually just more powerful than most uncommons. Yeah. And then you kind of have to play with it a little bit more, finesse it a little bit more in a higher power environment, but it's still sweet. You still get a lot of bodies for one card. Yeah. Yeah, I quite like I quite like doing the graveyardy theme in black and white. Because it's just they got stuff all along all along the curve, which I always appreciate. And nothing is bad. It's always just some sometimes it's just, you know, a a link to whatever the next spell you're gonna cast is rather than being the payoff on its own, but I always feel like that's a fun thing to do, and people enjoy doing it, and that's always something I like to focus on in cube. Are people enjoying that when they when they are playing this deck? Mm-hmm. And with the Graveyard Golgari, or Black Green, or Wither Bloom, whatever you want to call it stuff, I think that generally is the case. Yeah, formats where your graveyard is often like a second hand, mm-hmm. that's just historically something they keep coming back to. Like That is a thing that people enjoy doing. Yeah, I love doing it myself personally, so. Mm-hmm. All right, that is the show for today. We want to thank everybody for listening. Even if you just hit the play button or download button and then walked away, uh, that still counts. Make sure to subscribe to the 540 on anywhere that you're listening. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon, Stitcher, YouTube, even your local podcast app on your phone, whatever you got. Hit that subscribe button to make sure you know as soon as the episode goes live every week. And if you have the opportunity to leave us a review where you can, that is also very helpful. The algorithm loves when you leave reviews. They don't even have to be good reviews. You could be like, I like this podcast. Yeah, they don't have to be well-written written reviews. We, we prefer that they were good reviews. Yes. We don't have to be well well-written, correct. They can be brief. You can even give like a, like a, you could just put thumbs up in the review. Love it. Five stars. Great. Lovely. So please do that. It does very much help us. Uh, As a reminder, you can find me on Twitter at jparnell1. And my other podcast is Think Twice, which you can search Think Twice MTG on any audio platform like the one that you're on right now. If you want to see more of my stuff, Commander Versus which is also on YouTube at Star City Games, and uh, I stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash jparnell a couple times a week. So check that out. Ryan, what you got? You can check me out on Twitter, at Ryan Overdrive. I'm also writing weekly cube content on starcitygames.com this week. You would have seen it probably yesterday. It's going to be one of the articles where I break down the currently running Magic Online cube. I don't know what that cube is, 
because it's going to be one of the spotlight cubes. It runs for a week, comes out on Wednesday. I'll be writing up my thoughts. You will have that the day the cube goes live. There's going to be another spotlight cube. No idea what it is, but that's going to be the week after. And you'll find another article by me. And then down the line further, I'm going to have some more personal cube stuff, some cube theory stuff coming out on starcitygames.com. You can check all of that out and get any update, updates about any of that sort of thing on my Twitter, at Ryan Overdrive. Wonderful. That is the show for this week. We're going to be back next week with a bunch more Strixhaven talk. All the cards you've seen over the last week will have seen by then, and we're going to dig in. Uh, Ryan's going to tell you which one he hates more than Prismari Command, if there is one in the set, his least favorite card in the entire set. And Justin will tell you which one he hates more than Mudhole. <laughs> which is probably none of them. <laughs> Either way, thanks for listening. Catch you next time. <laughs>